My name is uh, Evan Light. I'm here to talk to you about DSLs and how to write them less painfully. Um, Stephen already set me up just a little bit to talk about DSLs. Uh, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about metaprogramming. So uh, here's the agenda. I'm going to give you a really quick uh, primer on different kinds of DSLs you can write in Ruby. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about a certain kind of DSL called uh, contextual DSLs. Actually, it's a, I think it was a classification that maybe OB came up with, OB Fernandez. Um, then we're going to talk about compilers of all things, and then we're going to talk about a little gem called your DSL. So, um, just pretend I'm as entertaining as uh, James Gray. I, I'll make an effort. I don't know if I'll succeed. So first, a uh, little story. Um, I came to, I guess, spending a lot of time thinking about DSLs in Ruby by way of this tool called Cucumber. Uh, I suspect uh, most of you used it. Can I see a show of hands for people who use Cucumber? Yeah, okay, about a third of your room, sure. So uh, Cucumber provides, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, it provides an external domain-specific language. That is, it's a specification for a language that's implemented in some other language, can be implemented in any number of other languages, really. Um, and it is for automated acceptance testing. And I like some ideas behind it, but I'm sorry, I, I don't like it. So I wrote something called CUDA. Uh, and CUDA does something kind of like what Cucumber does, except that it's focused on test unit. It's just Ruby code. It's an internal DSL, which means it's written in Ruby. It runs in Ruby. It's just Ruby. Um, and so this is how I got a lot of my education and suffered a lot of woes um, writing DSLs. So CUDA has been kind of a pet project of mine for a couple years. I, I use it in projects. Um, where I can, some of my customers prefer Cucumber. What are you going to do? Um, and it hasn't been, it's never, the implementation has never been up to snuff as far as I'm concerned. Because writing DSLs can be tricky. And we're going to talk a bit about that now. So, which do you guys prefer? A or B? These are both trying to do, the code samples are both trying to do basically the same thing. On the left side, we've got Webrick. You're creating a new instance of a Webrick server on port 4567. By the way, same as Sinatra does. We've got a Lambda where we are looking at an incoming HTTP request. And if it's a get, then the body is hello world. Otherwise, we send a 404 back. Then we take the Lambda, we attached it to the Webrick server as um, a proc handler servlet. Then we listen for a couple of traps. I mean, we trap on a couple of signals. And then we start the server. So you can do all that in 20 lines of code, or uh, you can do it in five. So for those of you who said that you prefer A, pork chop sandwiches. That's what I have to say to you. <laughs> if you don't get that reference, just Google pork chop sandwiches and go watch the video. I'm not allowed to show it in here because <clears throat> it's not family friendly. Um, so moving right along. So what is a DSL? Um, a DSL, domain-specific language, is a fancy way of saying an API that tries to tries to um, eschew, uh, sorry, ceremony, it tries to eschew ceremony, and tries to elevate the important, to elevate the content of what it is you're trying to say. It's trying to expose intent. That's what I was looking for. Uh, as opposed to, well, non-DSLE libraries, which can often get caught up in, well, noise, don't necessarily read quite as clearly. So going back to, sorry, pork chop sandwiches, going back to Webrick, this is not necessarily quite a DSL. You could maybe call it that. And this is a little bit more um, demonstrative. Pork so we'll talk more about that. Sorry, more pork chop sandwiches. Um, so flavors of DSL, <laughs> they, come <in> two different <laughs> they come in two different flavors, um, pretty much internal and external, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so some examples of internal DSLs. We saw Sinatra a moment ago. Uh, state machine is another one, common in Rails, active record. I'm pretty sure most of you know that one. Um, external DSLs, uh, CoffeeScript is a really good, very popular one these days. Gherkin, um, talking about Cucumber, is uh, an example. Gherkin is the pure text portion of Cucumber. And then Haml, of course, which I'm sure a lot of you guys use, which is just another form of markup. And it can exist in other programming languages. There's a Haml.js, for instance. So it's an external DSL. 
So now we're going to really focus on internal DSLs here, again, in particular, the contextual variety. But I'm sure most of you are familiar with something like, say, Axe is commentable, uh, class method DSL, where it's just you declare things in a fairly straightforward fashion. Um, you could argue net HTTP is a kind of DSL, although it's very tailored to, well, HTTP. But it's more of an instance method driven DSL. For example, we're calling set form data on an HTTP request and we're passing it some parameters. Um, and then Sinatra is a very good example of a contextual GSL. So contextual DSL, we are accumulating state across several different objects. And well, let's go in a little more a little bit into it. In this case with Sinatra, we're mapping HTTP verbs to routes. And these HTTP verb route pairs map to code blocks. And that's hiding all of the, the ceremony, but it's exposing the intent of saying that for this route, a post on the root URL, well, we're going to do something. So how do we build a contextual DSL? So the, the way that I've done it before, and it kind of hurts, is you end up making, or can make a class per context. So as you nest, you end up with a class for each block, essentially, for each level of block. I'll show you some, an example in a minute. Then you have an instance of that class per individual block. You'll see what I mean. And an instance eval is used to change self as you nest deeper into the DSL. So for an example, we have this wonderfully named whatever, um, which you'll have to excuse the name. It came out of uh, tests for uh, a gem I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And this DSL, or this example of a DSL, is maybe for configuring a web server. And then I added an ohi at the end just for fun. Um, because all cats are cool. So anyway, we've got a method set up, and it's setting some, some values, you know, workers and connections on the HTTP server. Then we're saying for HTTP, we're going to turn off log access. Then we nest. Then we specify we have a server listing in port 80. And then we nest again and say for this location at uh, root path, then we're going to have this doc root, and so on. So we want to accumulate all the state. And we, well, we, obviously, we want to try to write as little code as possible. And we want to make it clean. So the way I described earlier, if we have a class per type of context, then the context are, well, we've already got the whatever class. But then we have an HTTP context the server context, and then the location context. So that might look something like this. Um, so we've got the whatever class that we had before. And then we've got, when we create an instance of the whatever class, we create, let's see, we create an instance of the HTTP inside of, sorry, inside of the, the bloody hell, inside the HTTP method. We create an instance of the HTTP object, of course. Then we instance eval into that. We change self to be the inside of the HTTP object. And then inside the HTTP object, when we call server here on line 11, then that's calling this server method inside the HTTP class. We create an instance of the server object, and we nest so on and so on, basically, in this sort of Russian doll fashion. Now, I'm not actually doing anything here other than just collecting this information, creating objects, and not even really holding on to them right now. I'm just kind of demonstrating how one would kind of go through these Russian dolls. And this can get kind of painful, having all these instance evals, for one thing. It gets a little bit confusing, having all these different classes. Um, granted, OO is, is fine and all, but I find it's not, it, it's not too difficult to get tripped up in here. So while, I've been, while I was looking for ways to write this Coda library of mine better, I stumbled on Lispy, um, courtesy of Hacker News, because no one here reads Hacker News, right? Um, and Lispy is this gem for capturing DSLs, essentially, as, um, well, in a homo-iconic fashion, which is to say capture the code as data. And so then I went and looked at the, uh, the Git repo for it. And it hadn't changed very much since its release. I made a couple changes to it. But um, the author, uh, the author merged in a couple of my changes, but he didn't want to quite go the route I was going in with it. Didn't get back in touch with me for a few months, so fine, I forked it. But in any event, moving right along, Lispy is really a kind of compiler, I realized. And to me, this was kind of cool. I, uh, as an undergrad, I didn't have a compiler class. I felt like I missed out. This was a, a learning experience for me, a chance to, to explore a little. So we're going to talk about compilers now. So a compiler, 
Well, actually, first let me ask you, how many of you guys you know, study compilers at all? Ah, oh, actually quite a few of you. All right, cool. So for those of you who haven't, a uh, compiler is made up of three parts, a lexical analyzer, a parser, and a code generator. So a lexical analyzer basically breaks the code down into individual chunks and individual tokens, and that's done based on a set of rules. The parser will take that set of rules and those tokens and generate what's called an abstract syntax tree, which basically is a representation of the code minus all, of, really, all the syntactical stuff. It's the data and what you're trying to do to it. And then, it's okay, so right, now we're gonna talk about the abstract syntax tree a little bit. So, an example of an AST, what we have with this code sample on the left, well, this is, doesn't have to be Ruby, but basically is Ruby though, and this is for a to-do list, and one representation of it, and this would be you know, arguably a somewhat Lisp-like representation, by the way, this is what the original Lispy gem did, um, outputs this, which is a nested set of arrays that contain arrays that contain arrays that contain hashes that contain arrays that contain arrays. It gets a little bit hard to keep up with that. But um, in any event, though, that is an example of ASTs. We'll talk more about ASTs in a little bit. So a code generator given an AST can emit machine code or it can do other stuff. So it can emit source code, coffee script, or uh, it can emit interpreter instructions. So what if we created a compiler for an internal DSL? So for a lexical analyzer, Ruby already, well, lexical analyzes itself, it is an interpreter, so we don't have to do too much there. Uh, in terms of the parser, well, I actually, I used method missing, or actually, sorry, I should say Lispy before I even got there, I used method missing to collect data to build up the AST I showed you earlier. Um, and ASTs normally store data in things that are called symbolic expressions. Um, and a symbolic expression is usually just a list of the action or the method or function that was trying to be performed, the expression um, and the values involved. And in this case, what I chose to do when I'm modifying Lispy was to take more of an O, slightly more OO approach. This is a struct, for example. So they're not really sex Ps. I call them sex P alikes. Um, so you might say, ah, it's not really a symbolic expression. Um, so you, you might say that, you know, why aren't you using real symbolic expressions? So we already, you know, we already, went, we already, went, excuse me. Uh, we already went down the, uh, the rat hole of AST. So as far as why I wouldn't want to use this structure, it's because you end up with something like this. You end up iterating over arrays and you end up using indices to get into, get values out of your AST, and it gets pretty ugly fast. This is just an example from uh, some of the test code from the Lispy gem. So instead, I prefer to have the, the struct-based approach um, using, well, just something that looks just like this. So in any event, um, what you end up with is something a bit more semantic, like this, where you have from the, the DSL sample I showed you earlier, we'll talk about it a little bit more, you end up asking for args and you end up asking for scope when you wanna know about the nested block or you ask for the line number as opposed to asking for indexes into a list. So now in terms of writing a generator for your intern the internal DSL, well, if you're given an AST, then basically it's up to you. What do you wanna generate? What are you trying to do with your DSL? So um, basically it's whatever you want it to be. So I took Lispy and I made it into this Your DSL gem, uh, having added some more features onto it. And it's essentially a contextual DSL symbolic expression alike recorder. And it gives you an AST that, well, you can iterate through and do whatever the heck you want with. In my case, I used it to actually run the interpreter. Um, so you get a code comes in and an AST comes out. So um, given an input, you know, so given, given this DSL, that the HTTP DSL that I showed you earlier, and just a couple extra lines of code, you know, extend your DSL, record your DSL, and bearing in mind, forget the, the, the code sample I showed you earlier where I actually declared some methods in the whatever class. Pretend there's nothing else there. It's just what you see here. This will still actually run. It won't generate any errors, even without any implementation. You just have an AST sitting there waiting for you to do something with it. So that can be handy. Um, and it generates an AST that looks something like this. 
So you have an output object with expression objects inside of it and scope objects with more expression objects inside of it. And you're, probably look, you're probably thinking something like that. But you can take this sample of code here where we have an acceptance test DSL that has a feature and it says in order to do something as a CUDA developer, I want to provide something or other. You have a scenario that has test steps inside of it. You can take all that with this code that is a little small for you guys, but we'll walk through it real fast. This is basically how I'm using, how I'm using your DSL. It's not to say how you guys, you guys might do something completely different with it, but for example, um, for each scenario, I go through here and I generate a test method on the test class. And then what I'm doing is I go through the expressions in the output, and for each one of those expressions in the output, if it's a scenario, then I go and generate a test method. And then when I'm generating the test method, I go through each, oops, I go through each one of these steps in here. Oh, I keep flipping back and forth. Uh, where do we go? I go through each one of the steps. Right, I'm executing the test steps here. Go through each one of the steps, get the expressions off the, the, the step. And then if there is a block there, then I execute it. If there isn't a block there, then I emit some messages. So it takes, this code takes this and runs a test. Okay, that by itself, not terribly exciting. So basically, I'm using test unit. Woohoo, that's really cool, yay. Um, but, so great, I use compilers, compilers are cool, so are Stetsons and people who actually understand what this joke is. Um, so, let me skip ahead just for a second. The other cool thing you can do is that, well, you can use this gen, you can use the generator to do something else, for example, you can take the AST and you can interpret it into plain English. And that's really very easy to do. We'll get to talk about that in a sec. So why a compiler for internal DSLs? The most important reason to me is separating your DSL language or separating your domain specific language from its implementation. Because when they're tightly coupled, it makes for some really complicated code. I don't really think I need to explain to you guys why tight coupling is not necessarily a good thing all the time. The prototyping is easy because, as I said, as you guys, if you guys just use your DSL and you just write code because of method missing, nothing fails. You can implement your DSL a little teeny bit at a time, and it's still, well, it'll still run. It won't error on you. Um, AST can be simpler than just having a whole bunch of instance evals as you nest contexts because you can just iterate through the AST and do what you want with it. You can have one instance eval, which is basically what I'm doing, instead of having like three. So it's a little, you have, you still have, you still have to meta program, but you can centralize that logic more potentially. And then switching the generators, as I mentioned, can be really cool. So as I said here, you know, say you still don't have any method definitions. And this is still, as I said, this is actually going to run. So it makes prototyping really easy. So let's see. And this is where I mentioned that we can take the DSL implementation we have here with two different generators, run the tests, uh, generate some textual output, do whatever. So this English gets generated basically by this code. And this is just a simple walk of a tree structure. Really not anything terribly complex. Just you start, with the, uh, you start at the top of the AST, and then we iterate through the expressions. And if we see it in order to as a I want to, we just barf out a string. And if we see a scenario, then we dig deeper into the scenario. We go into its scope, which basically says, hey, I want the block, I want what represents the block for that, that, uh, that DS, for that object, and that part of the AST. And then we iterate through the expressions there, and then we just barf out some English. And then we've got this. So to wrap up, AST is gonna be really helpful with your internal DSLs. An internal DSL compiler may be handy for other people. I'd like to believe so. It allowed me to take a lot of ugly code in CUDA and literally rewrite it in a half hour. And I don't think it's a testament to me. I think it's more a testament to the power of the idea behind it, you know, as ASTs are kind of a, a proven idea, a proven concept. The DSL gem provides a, a fairly simple implementation. Um, if you guys want to fork it, play with it, do what you want with it. And uh, I'm open to more input on it. And, um, oh yeah, right, so 
I'm also a skeptic, like Jim. I created this little group near where I live called Free Ocean City Thinkers, but the point of mentioning that I'm a skeptic is that um, feel free to call bullshit on this idea. If you think it's terrible or if you think it can be done better, please let me know. Uh, also, I run this event in Northern Virginia called Ruby Decamp, and um, it's free. We've got a whopping two more spots open. It's in the middle of September. Awesome. <laughs> there you go, it's awesome. And, um, but I think we might actually have a few more spots opening up because we always have some cancellations at the last minute. So if any of you guys feel like coming, check it out, you know, let me know. Um, I, it, I said it's free, but you can't just sign up. You have to get an invitation code to get in. And uh, another, the last thing is that I uh, keep some office hours online where I make myself available for a couple of, or a few hours every week, basically just to hack with people because I mentioned Ocean City, Maryland. I live in the middle of nowhere, and there are no people like you guys around. And I like hanging around other new Ruby nerds. It's one of the reasons I come to events like this. So um, if you feel like hacking on something or just banding some technical ideas around, please feel free to give me a shout out. I've got a calendar up on Google Calendars. You can sign up for an hour of my time, and we'll just chat, hack, whatever. So uh, thanks. That's it. Any questions? Anyone? Steve. So uh, one of the things about that makes me think about ASTs recently was I know for a fact that uh, Aaron Patterson rewrote all of Active Record based on ASTs because it used to be doing string concatenation and doing the AST thing made it like made Active Record be way more performant than it used to be. So I don't know if you've done any like looking to see how could have compared when you made that transition. But that might be something that's I, interesting to investigate, especially when Ruby has problems with tons of nested scopes that the garbage collector, that it seems like it might be a performance increase as Maybe. well. Okay, so let me repeat the question slash comment. Um, Steve was saying that Active Record was rewritten using ASTs heavily, and that resulted in a performance increase. And also that, well, Rails has lots of nesting in, well, various parts of it, and wondered if something like this might be useful, and whether I did any performance comparisons with CUDA. I'm pretty sure at this point it's actually, or it's quite possibly a little bit slower, and that's, and I'll say that's only because the way that your DSL works, basically the way Lispy worked, it still has the same approach, it's just factored a little bit better, is that it generates the AST and then it gives it to you and then you walk it. So if you have to traverse the AST twice, essentially, you, you, you input into it and then you walk it, then it might run a little bit slower than, say, if you used a visitor pattern maybe while you're generating it. I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure. But no, I, I didn't do any performance comparisons. Uh, other questions? Yes, David. Do you know how many good overviews of recursive descent compilers? Like I've had some formal education in compilers. Yeah, I had some still. external DSLs, but none of them needed a recursive descent compiler to work. Do I, okay, so the question is, do I know of any good way to get an education in re recursive descent parsing, which is actually what I didn't have to do any of that with Lispy, because A, it was, you know, the structure of Lispy was already there it just wasn't factored at all well and was missing some features I needed. Um, and hang on just a sec, <laughs> I'll get you. But um, I did do a little bit of, of research by way of compilers. Um, I took one, level, one master's level class that happened to be in finite automata and we did talk about that sort of thing once upon a time. Um, and frankly, I ended up doing an awful lot of Googling and I ended up all over Wikipedia and there were, the Wikipedia articles were surprisingly pretty good. So, you know, it might sound a little crazy, but start there. Yes? Oh, yeah, I was going to kind of answer this question. There's one called JSON. I'm sorry, what was one called like, JSON? It's kind of like a device in the Oh, and the, the, uh, that there's a, a JSON. Um, right. right. You can specify rules in JSON, basically. Yeah. You can create an AST based on this. Yeah, there are, well, there are a whole bunch of tools that they're tool. There's, there's as well, there's RAC, uh, R A C C. For Ruby that I looked at as well, just a little tiny bit. Uh, but you're, at that point, you're really talking about uh, external DSLs, not so much internal DSLs. In this case, this is cheating almost, it feels like, because it's just using method missing to record all this stuff. So the, only, the, the, the AST as such is accumulated by nesting on calling method missing and building up essentially a, its own internal call stack in order to be able to rewind and get back to the right level. Any other questions? I see a hand up in the back. If you looked into, how would you compare what you're doing uh, contrast with maybe using something like Ometa or you know, packref parsing, those types of things? 
Um, the question was, how, how would I compare what your DSL is doing to something called Ometa and pack rat parsing? Unfamiliar, but I'd love to hear more. Any other questions? Gone once, gone twice. All right, cool. Well, thanks for letting me talk. Thanks for the questions.